Hi, so great to meet you all virtually, and I am so honored and delighted to be part of this conference. My name is Sally Lerman, and I'm founder and CEO of The Trust Project. So last week at this time, I was working with dozens of people across the UK, the US, and Brazil all toward one thing, to make sure the details of our eight trust indicators were in place on dozens of news sites new to the trust project. We were working on Slack, on Trello, and video calls. And on Wednesday, I'm very happy to tell you all of these sites went live with the trust indicators, the trust mark logo, and all that they signify. So there are 25 sites that have just gone live with two newsletters in addition to that. It didn't just happen overnight. People at these sites worked months with us to learn the eight trust indicators, to discuss questions about ethics, corrections, and transparency around staff diversity with each other. They wrestled with their content management systems and they worked with their staffs to make sure that every detail was in place. And why? To build trust with their audiences. So with this round, we added many local and regional news sites, and we added a site that mainly serves American Indians. We added two newsletters. So I'll show you, let me just open up my deck and I'm gonna um, share my screen and play from the start. So these sites um, that you see here are many local and regional sites they are um, joining sites across the US and Canada and Latin America. And um, all together, we have more than, you can just see the list here. All together, we have more than 250 sites showing the trust indicators on their pages. There are sites in, across the globe um, in these many places. So today I wanna to tell you about the why behind the Trust Project, what we know about impact, our research, some of the debates and the resistance that we ran into, um, how we work, our successes, and of course, an invitation to join our work. So first of all, why a Trust Project at all? When I first started the Trust Project, news was struggling. Our business model wasn't working online. And we didn't know how to convince people why journalism mattered. Now, I'm a journalist. I've been a journalist covering science and social issues related to science from my earliest career days. And of course, this was painful. <laughs> Everything online looked the same. A news story, an article meant to sell you a pair of shoes, something designed to make you upset about a particular cultural issue or even to trick you into thinking that a particular person or community was someone who deserved your anger or your hate. So new sites tried to get better at clickbait. In the US, we showed pictures of celebrities, of people arrested for crimes. That's not journalism. We did it to get people to come to our sites. They may have come to our sites as a result, but not surprisingly, they stopped trusting us or believing that our work mattered very much. So my idea was to flip the picture. How could we use online systems to support quality instead of to undermine it? So the Trust Project was born. And let me say right now, it's working. So the idea behind the Trust Project is for news organizations, for journalism, to restore its role or their role as a guiding light in society. And so we see it here. If you can imagine here, the public sort of adrift on the sea of information, trying to find facts they need about the issues and ideas, simply where to get the best price on the best tea, maybe. They're like fishermen over here in this boat. And then over here, we have the engines and uh, search engines and social media who are kind of like a cruise ship shepherding people here and there, sometimes not very well. And the idea is that journalism can be like the lighthouse, showing the way for all, a guiding light to help people find unbiased information, information that helps them make informed decisions about their governments, their communities, and their own lives. 
So in the trust project, we do this through the eight trust indicators, which people see both on news, or news site pages and also in our markup, schema.org markup. And by that, I mean the code behind each news story page. And we have measured our impact. So at first, the trust indicators were just an idea. It was something that we had developed and it made a log of, lot of sense logically, but we honestly didn't know if it worked. We worked with new sites to put them in place to, and to see how they performed. And at the very same time, a bit of a leap of faith, we asked the University of Texas at Austin to test them. We asked the University of um, Georgia to test them. And we worked with the international research firm Ipsos to test our ideas. And through that work, we now know that building trust does matter. It does help um, perceptions of value in a news site, time with a news site, time with ads, and a willingness to pay. So subscriptions and other kinds of memberships. And finally, there's a broader purpose as well, which is about building community and political support for free speech, for journalism itself, for journalism that is honest and is able to challenge powerful players in the system. So we learned in our work with Ipsos, this international research firm in 2020, that people really do want to be informed. They seek out trustworthy news. This was a study with about 39,000 adults in 28 countries, including Japan. And in Japan, interestingly, people had low confidence in their own, not only others' ability to identify real news, but their own ability as well. Um, and yet, just like everyone else, they were very much interested in seeking out trustworthy news. And then, uh, to, sorry, to the next slide, um, we found that people are willing to pay for news they can trust. So it was 27% in this Ipsos trust study and around 30% in two studies commissioned by the trust project. So trust leads to loyalty, which leads to willingness to pay. And these are just broad brush findings that I'm telling you about. I can provide more detail, of course, if you want. So the process. Now, the trust indicators weren't um, just something that sprang out of my head or that came out of academia. First, we talked with people that matter, and that means the public. So I invited people, I invited consultants to interview people in depth about why they valued the news. How did they decide when to trust it? How did they decide when not to trust it? So these are where these interviews were conducted in many places in the US as well as in Europe. And in since then that we've done additional work, I will say we haven't done it in Asia and that would be a really good place to do it. Um, sorry, we're not there yet. So then we took what we learned and brought together news executives from Europe, Canada, Latin America, and the United States to listen to these user needs and wants. We met in a series of workshops to marry those user needs and wants with journalistic values. So more than 100 news executives were involved in the very beginning. And since then, we've involved many more. Now, you may know this, this treat, cotton candy. I think of that when I think about developing the trust project. This process was a little bit like it. You start with a little sugar then you turn it and turn it and turn it until you have spun it into something that was just a little thing into a large, beautiful and significant object. And journalists around the world continue to help spin it and to help grow. And that's one important thing about the Trust Project. We are deeply collaborative. So what were these user needs that we started with, um, that we originally discovered? Well, we started with four user types that we identified in our first set of research. And this was back in 2015, 2016. The avid news user, this is the person who's out there checking and cross-checking the news. They are curating and pushing it out to folks. Um, and so just very, we call them avid, engaged. These are the folks that subscribe to news and maybe did, here's Alma, she, grew up reading the Detroit Free Press. And, but it's a little bit overwhelming. There was too much for her to look at and yet she didn't completely feel satisfied. So 
engaged with the news, reading it, talking about it, and yet still not fully satisfied. Then there's the opportunistic user. So here's Wendy, she's 27 years old, living with her in-laws because her husband's out of a job, she's got two children. She doesn't have time to go out there and check and cross check the news. Like Alex over here, I didn't give you her name, but um, who's got her own company and is kind of managing a lot, but still very effectively. Um, so Wendy here um, understands the needs for news, but it's just there when it's there for her. So again, um, perhaps when it's showing up in a, um, a notification on her phone, or maybe when she's in her um, office and it shows up on a television screen uh, there in the break room. The time we had also had a group we called the angry disengaged. These are folks who just had stopped paying attention to the news. They felt it didn't serve them. They didn't believe that it was honest. Um, and we still recognize these folks today, and I will tell you how they have changed. But first, let me tell you about what was very similar across all of these different groups, which was so interesting to see, is that they were looking for many of the same things on news sites to decide what to trust. So as we look at them, these were the things that they wanted to know. So first, the agenda. They talked about, well, we understand Journalists aim to be impartial, but nobody is. So tell us what your agenda is. Diverse perspectives. We heard from people who um, said, we're tired of hearing just from people at high levels of business and government. That doesn't earn our trust. We want to see people like ourselves in the news. People often felt left out. And they also talked about seeing people unlike themselves. So they recognize the role of journalism in bringing people together across differences, as well as bringing, you know, helping them understanding what's happening at the highest levels of business and government. The journalists, people wanted to know who is this journalist? Well, what are their values? Where are they coming from? What's the expertise? Think about that in terms of relationship, of building trust, of wanting to know where the other party is coming from, what they're like before trusting them. Again, do you share our values? Can I rely on you? Can I rely on um, you being consistent and ethical? What am I looking at? People talked about not being able to differentiate between news and opinion and not really trusting that journalists could tell the difference because it all looks so much the same. How do you know what we know? What, yeah, how do you know what you know, sorry. People talked about um, wanting to know more about what was behind a news story. So how did the journalists get this information? We heard that from lots of folks. Locally sourced. So getting a little deeper to in that point, do you know me? Do you know my community? Were you here when you covered that issue? Um, and if you weren't, what did you do to try to find out more about me and my people? Let me participate. So a much higher um, desire for engagement both on and off the page than um, we had seen previously. And this will seem very familiar to you now because it's become quite common. Now we started out with 37 trust indicators out of those that research plus the journalistic values. And of course, no site's gonna put 37 trust indicators up. So we ended up, this is a Trello board showing them. We ended up narrowing it down to eight. And here they are. Um, and, um, what we found out in more recent interviews. So we did another round in 2021, and we found that indeed those trust indicators do hold up. They do respond to uh, how people are still thinking about and wondering about the news, how they still continue to try to evaluate the news. The biggest differences we found were that each of those four user types had become more engaged with the news. And, it, and it's not surprising, I mean, what's been happening in the past couple of years or even up leading up to 2020 was so much happening in the world around the climate, the environment, um, governments, politics, COVID. So people really wanted to be engaged with the news and the avid people became more involved on the street. So using the news to take action. The engaged, uh, those who were just were subscribers and paying attention became more like the avid. So checking and cross-checking, really going to the news. 
the opportunistic became more like the old informed. So internally engaged and maybe checking the news once or twice a day, or um, maybe not more than that because it was overwhelming, but consistently reaching out for it. And then finally, um, the angry disengaged, unfortunately became engaged with untrustworthy news. So I show you these user part types in part so that you, to inspire you, I guess, to know that it's more, we should be thinking more than about just these folks who are engaged with untrustworthy news. We really need to reach out to those two middle categories, which I call the anxious middle, because they could go either direction. They can become more like the avid and taking action based on the news that they discover and can evaluate well, or without our help, do they become more engaged with um, untrustworthy news? They're more vulnerable to that. So I see a lot of opportunity in this, and I also feel that we have to really step up and continue to step up. Here are a few examples of the trust indicators on pages around the world, so you can see uh, that there's some there's a lot of similarity, but they're also within the design of, of the page itself. So of the site's design, you can see here they, they're part of the trust project, information about the journalists, that's part of the um, uh, trust, that's a trust indicator. Um, news, there's a definition there that is shared across all the news partners. Um, so that's one article page, and this would click through to a um, journalist page with more information about that journalist. Here's the Washington Post showing our best practices trust indicator, which is a set of standards and policies that show the agenda behind journalism, which is basically to serve the public, to serve the public interest. And how do we ensure that we do that? Well, we set guardrails in place, such as our ethics policies and corrections policies. So there's a whole set of disclosures there that we ask for. And then over here is Yes Magazine showing one of those um, article type labels and its definition that again is shared across the, the partners. So we're trying to create more consistency um, across all of these different disclosures so that people can recognize them page to page and site to site. Here's a couple of um, journalist profiles. So as I said, they'll look different visually, but there are the structures behind them are the same, the pieces, the disclosures are the same in another um, description here. So getting to how well this project has worked internally among news organizations. And I was asked, well, what were the debates? So in our collaborations, sometimes of course we disagreed and sometimes we do now. So at first, editors were afraid to publish their ethics policies. They just said, we're not going to do it. People might sue us. Um, now, however, this is common to publish your ethics policy. And I don't hear that concern anymore, let's say. Uh, another one was around diverse voices. So diverse voices is where we respond to that concern that we're only hearing from people at high levels of business and government, that we're not hearing, especially from people unlike us and also like ourselves. And I would hear from news organizations outside of the US, that's an American thing. Or I would hear from the U US editors, well, a lot of surprise, let's say, around the fact that people were really looking for that. So the idea that that's, not an, that's an American thing well, I respond, not quite. There are divisions in any society. And we heard a lot about that in the last couple of, year, couple of years as people started to speak up. So I ask you to think about what are the divisions within your own society and who tends to get left out of the news? Which voices do um, not appear and that really deserve to be heard? The next area where we start, we got some disagreement or pushback maybe was in the area of labeling. So news versus opinion versus analysis versus paid con content were all categories that even though the public felt that we weren't disclosing them very well, we were pretty much in agreement about the differences. And we were able to with some work with our news partners come up with some very clear definitions across these categories. Now, the terminology of other news types can differ though in different parts of the world. 
Um, so for example, in Spain and in Latin America, individuals and companies can pay to have a press release printed. That's rare in the United States. So it wasn't on our list. But we soon learned that smaller sites in the US do print unpaid press releases without any edits at all. So we added press release, we added some definitions around that. And so what we've discovered is one, um, news is changing around the world and we need to continue to keep up with it. And two, even though there are these, I would say modest differences, mostly in terminology, fundamentally there is a very clear thing that journalism is and it is distinct from other kinds of information. So our definitions of what journalism is because they were came to them through a collaborative process really do hold up globally. Now, in building our network, we also ran across three specific things that I would call amount to a type of resistance. Um, uh, actually, let me, I forgot to mention this point. Um, well, let me jump, I, what, I'm sorry, I kind of got off track here. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our process and then I'll come back to the resistance. Um, so on our process, we have um, new sites, they place this trust mark on their pages and um, new sites that they first, they express their interest. We explain who we are and what we do and invite them to apply. We vet them carefully and we put them in a cohort to learn the eight trust indicators and to place them on their sites. And when they're finished, we allow them to use the Trustmark logo on their pages. So that's what you see here on Wisconsin Watch. And what we found based on user research at the University of Georgia was that this here is the best placement of the Trustmark logo. Uh, and here they say why well, you can trust Wisconsin Watch. That actually isn't the best way to show um, or to build trust. It's something that's a little less um, demanding maybe and says um, something like, we are part of the trust project. So it invites you to learn more instead of saying, well, you know, trust us because we're us. Um, now we also work closely with search and social media organizations to help them improve their understanding of news in with integrity. And the trust indicators are integrated into their system. So this is just a, I, I'm sorry, it's all in English, but it's just something from their search guidelines for um, news editors. And they talk about how they use specific um, oops, trust indicators um, to help assess whether a site is trustworthy. Um, and so it's mentioned down here, the best practices, and then also um, specifically information such as a mission statement, editorial policies, and so on. And then here is an example from Facebook where we're helping Facebook or we help them early on differentiate between news and other kinds of information. And we help them through conversations and then also just the clear definitions that were always in um, embedded in the trust indicators. So I would like to see this done more clearly and obviously on um, tech platforms, if only just to apply the trust indicators as a news literacy tool. And so we're working with these organizations to try to um, help that happen. So before I go on to tell you a little bit more about um, how these, we more about what we've learned about our users, let me tell you about some of the resistance that we might um, get from um, sites that are interested in participating. One is the worry that we certify sites and people would say, well, who are you to be doing that? And that's simply a misperception. We strongly believe that the public has a right to make their own informed decisions about what news to trust. Our job is to help them make those decisions based on solid factors, those eight trust indicators. So we don't certify news sites or articles, but we do vet sites that want to be a trust project partner. We check to see whether or not they are truly independent of influence, that they check their facts and operate with integrity, 
And we work with them to integrate the trust indicators and check compliance when they're finished. So the second one gets to an unwillingness on the part of new sites to accept that they actually do need to earn trust. And these are often larger sites and sometimes small local ones. And we just wish they would pay more attention to what the public is saying and also have a stronger desire to expand their audiences. So, and here's a little bit more about what we found people were saying in the more recent interviews. We found they're emotionally exhausted, that the news is overwhelming. It is too, so negative. I mean, it's just hard to pay attention to the news. Um, as this person said, I'm always looking for information that isn't just to scare or to push bias. I'm looking for actionable information that I can participate on. So acknowledging that people are really looking for trustworthy information is um, something I feel that we all have to do. And we have to not only recognize that what we have traditionally put on our sites is simply not enough. We have to do more. Um, overwhelm. People talked about being in kind of getting to that point. People in our most recent interview, many of them talked about being concerned about fake news. They were concerned, they used that term, for concerned because with social media, it's everywhere and you can just start believing it. So a lot of anxiety about being tricked into believing false information and also into being part of the process of spreading false information. So again, this is where we can step up as news organizations and as researchers working with news organizations to show, um, in our case, the trust indicator. So very simple, straightforward system that enables people to assess what they're looking at and can kind of relieve that and also empower people at the same time, build confidence. And the other people, thing is that people were looking still for diversity. And now it's looking for diversity across um, those things that we were, people were talking about earlier. So the different components or the constituent groups of society and also ideological differences. So people would say, this is one example, different perspectives bring more information to the table and the truth lies somewhere in the middle. So folks again are very actively we found out trying to sort their way through this information now the last little issue that we run across quite a bit now is some sites don't follow our practices or i say let me rephrase that some sites do follow our practices or even some of the tech platforms use our practices but they don't want to acknowledge where they got their ideas so unfortunately, that's damaging to our efforts because, as I said, we're trying to build this momentum behind more transparency, more disclosure, and consistency so that people can begin to recognize these similarities. And so even though I, we're not active right now in Japan, I, I encourage you to look at our website, to look at these different trust indicators, and to think about how can you how can you apply them in your own world? You maybe use our, our definitions, for example, and, and also point to the trust project rather than trying to create something on your own in, that's new. Um, so fortunately, more and more of these problems that I mentioned are falling into the background as the trust project grows in number and influence. So overall, I feel that the news industry really has risen to the occasion in the case of the trust indicators. They're responding to a crisis of trust and anxiety, as you see, around the news. And so the trust indicators have grown into a simple, easy system for news organizations to demonstrate their values and practices and a simple news literacy tool. We've had a major impact on the way technology platforms assess what news with integrity looks like. We've sparked major new traditions in journalism, things like news labeling, journalist disclosures, even correcting errors. And I say this because it's about the news industry as a whole. It is about how our news partners and then others beyond them have really stepped up in response to the public need. And 
yet we still have a long way to go. Our news partners need to show the trust mark more clearly on their websites. They need to be more responsive to cranky complaints from users. We need to help them do that. And we need to learn more about what users are looking for and how to show them the tremendous value in journalism. So yes, I feel that we and the many others that are working in this realm are making progress, but we need to keep up the work. So I invite you to join our cause. For researchers, help us learn more about how social media might use the trust indicators more effectively for news literacy. How might we convince people to be more thoughtful about the news they share and use in these spaces? And then how might we convince search and social media that they really need to do more? And I know that's an ongoing problem, but we can continue to work on that. For news sites, the first thing I would say is label. Um, so at least opinion and analysis and use our definitions to, I invite you to use these definitions to describe the differences between news and other points of types of information. Listen and respond. So open up to your audiences, maybe more than you have in the past and take some risks. And above all else, when people complain, not when they're like trolling you or attacking you or threatening you, but when you, when you feel it's a, maybe it could be a little bit hostile complaint, but it's still a, somebody that has, could have goodwill behind it, let's say, respond and take it a little ways to see if you can bring this person over. Because in general, we hear from folks that newsrooms just don't care. And, and that's wrong because newsrooms truly do care. And then make corrections, another way of showing that you care and that you are being responsive. So finally, thank you for listening. I really appreciate the time today and I look forward to the discussion.